The only thing worse than Justin Trudeau is putting Justin Trudeau in a clone machine and him coming out blonde. On this episode of the Stinking Albatross podcast. There were more than 2 million votes cast, 2.1 million. It came down to just over 400 in those three ridings that determined who was going to win or lose government. I think they're one of the most courageous pro-life organizations in the United States. On the other hand, I wish that no pro-life organization had charitable tax status. Today's episode is brought to you by LaRosse Media Incorporated. They make professional videos to fit any budget, so next time you need a commercial, promo, or corporate video, think LaRosse. Check them out at larossemedia.com. Hello and welcome to the Stinking Albatross podcast. My name is Alyssa Globe, and I'm here after a while with my partner in crime, Scott Hayward. How is it going, Scott? Would it be any better, Alyssa? <laughs> what has happened since we last talked? We had Thanksgiving, which no. is probably one of my favorite holidays in terms of food and you know what the turkey it was fantastic the sides were fantastic it was a huge step up from last year back to the first two years that my wife and I did it and we were really really happy with the way everything went we had Halloween and we took uh I took the kids out trick-or-treating for the very first time um so they got a decent haul of candy for the amount of places that they went to uh, the Bombers are hosting the West Division Final for the fourth straight year now in the CFL, and they have a really good chance of not only going to the Grey Cup, but winning it as well, according to the odd makers. And those Winnipeg Jets just keep on rolling 12 1 and 0. Uh, only the uh-huh. 16, sixth team in NHL history to start with that record. Yes, their one loss was to the Maple <laughs> Leafs. The Maple Laughs. I know, um, it's embarrassing for you. <laughs> Although they almost came back in that game. The Jets were down I know. nothing. <laughs> and then they got it, they got it to a 10 5 4 with like two minutes left. I was like, they can't. Mm-hmm. They they need they need a loss to to correct all the things that went wrong in that game, and they have. So tomorrow they play the Avs, which is gonna be a big game, and then Dallas as well. So although Toronto is uh, in a playoffs position right now. Are they not? Although they seem like a bit of a juggle. I think they're bro. Team. I think they're at. Yeah, they're like. I don't know. They're they've won the same as they've lost. I don't know the exact. Yeah, they're, they're around just it, breaking NHL even. Five hundred. Yeah, they'll, yeah. they'll go on a streak of like three losses in a row, then like a couple of wins, and then they're losing to teams that they should beat. Uh, they're beating. It's teams a, it's the same story. Team. It, there's nothing different going on. <laughs> it's literally, I think I saw something where it was the, like they're in the exact same position as last year. No. Yeah. Hey, but you know what? They beat Boston last night for a rip. So yeah, that was nice, but, and without yeah. Matthews. So. Oh, really? Is he, was he injured? Yeah. He has an upper body injury. Oh, how long is he out for? It's a day to day. Oh, okay. All right. Cause I think like David comes back to the lineup yeah. tonight or tomorrow or something like that. So Anyway, uh, yeah, yes. I'm good, and my life is based on food and sports. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone knows. Yeah, well, we had a little bit of a hiatus because uh, we did some traveling, which we'll talk about. We went to the three provinces that had the three provincial elections. And also around that time, I was selling my house, which was an extremely stressful process. I hope I told my husband that the next time we're moving is he's moving my dead body out of whatever, whatever house we're living in while well, this current I like, house, I, I, guess. I like how you assume that you're done before he gets, <laughs> that you're here before he leaves well you know what my grandparents were 11 years apart and my grandma died at like 64 and my grandpa died at 94 so i just yeah. assume that's how it works <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's the law it's the rule yeah do you know that each – my mom was saying that uh, on her side, on the Thompson side, she's one of 11, and she her uh, mother has passed away and her oldest sister has passed away, and nobody's made it past 64. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. So. And then... <laughs> We're just like, all right, you got uh, eight years left or whatever. <laughs> it's nice to know when someone's going to die. You can prepare. No, I'm just You kidding. actually just have a huge party for everybody. Yeah, you made it. This is it. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, yeah, so we sold our house. That was extremely, extremely stressful. Bought a new house, also stressful. Still going through that sort of process, but at least everything's finalized. Um, and now just have to pack, which is mm -hmm. just so overwhelming. <laughs> and uh, yeah, move in just the weekend of December 4th. So hopefully we'll be all settled in around Christmas. But uh, like, yeah, we don't even have furniture to to put in this house and it's just really chaotic. So uh, <laughs> at least we sold the house though. So that is the most stressful part that's over. And uh, I didn't think I told you this, but then we always talk about how this happens, but my son was sick for the last two days. Um, and today I thought, I thought uh, like, so he got up at the one, like two nights ago at 10 o'clock and I, sometimes he just cries. So I was like, Oh, and Aaron went in and, uh, is this, this is baby or is this, this is Noah, my two-year-old. Yeah. And he comes and he's like, Noah threw up. And I was like, no. And the whole night from 10 p.m. to like 7 a.m., every single, like every 10 to 20 minutes, just writhing in pain, throwing up or trying to like, yeah, just, it was horrible. But it, he had a horrible, I don't know what it is. Honestly, no one else is sick. And it lasted like 12 hours. And then he was fine. And today I was just giving him like soup and toast and things. But then at dinner, I gave him what we had for dinner and no, yeah, <laughs> did not so work well. out. Did not yeah. work out. So um, he's fine again, but just his stomach is super for, sensitive. So it now. sounds to me like more like a, like a food reaction or a um, food poisoning. Like it doesn't, he never had a fever. No one else is sick. Like it doesn't sound like the flu, but who knows who Too much Halloween candy. Maybe he has like a secret stash of Halloween candy in his <laughs> room that you're not aware of. And he's just chomping away at that. Halloween that would candy be Abby. Yeah. <laughs> Halloween candy in our house did not make it past. I don't even think it made it to midnight of Halloween. Oh. <laughs> you know fun. what? Pretty split. Aaron and I were talking about how we went through the Halloween candy and it was such garbage. Like the Halloween candy nowadays sucks. Like there are maybe my kids got two or three Reese's, but there's like no crunchies, no crispy crunch, no caramels, like oh, nothing. Oh, love the caramels, my no kids Oreo, love. just like but, all this jelly crap and uh, oh. yeah, gummy, yeah, yeah, no gummy stuff, whatever. Like I don't mind Swedish berries. Suckers. Mm. yeah yeah and then coffee the crisp and all those like oh no thank you really you don't like the coffee crisp oh what about, what about kid cat narrow Th those are just so boring and lame like no thanks <laughs> they are the least expensive boxes of candy i know um uh, my daughter has an absolute deep abiding love affair with smarties so mm. that is uh that is her go-to her uh, boxes of yeah. Smarties. Just one. Just one. Taco, just one. Well, there's like four of. in each. So it's the, I prefer that probably to give my kids than like a, you know, a full out chocolate bar. But uh, there's this one. Sure, go ahead. There's this one lady around the corner from our house. And I swear when we move, I'm going to come back to this neighborhood because every <laughs> year she has a bonfire, like a fire pit oh, in the cool. driveway. She gives out full size chocolate bars and she has full size like cans of alcoholic beverages for the for the um, parents. And there's like beer, there's spritzers, there's everything. She's like, here. Oh, yeah. So I was just like walking around. <laughs> <laughs> it was we, awesome. We, we, we might drive out to calgary for uh, a little trick-or-treating maybe next year why did it suck in manitoba uh no i mean like my my daughter's three my son's one and a half so we just went to you know grandma and grandpa some aunts and uncles some cousins yeah, okay them. and then uh we came we came back and we have a tradition in, in uh our family by my wife and i that uh just to make things easy um we we prepare some pizzas the night before or a couple days before put them in the freezer, then just bake them. Um, so that's what we have for supper because it's just kind of easy to mm -hmm. go, no problem. Um, you can you know, kind of pop up from the couch or pop up from the dining room table and go give candy to kids that come out the door, uh, not an issue. Although we only had like 10 kids come to our door. Mm -hmm. um, but when, so I said, uh, I said to my wife, I'll take the kids out to uh, my mom and dad's and 
um, you know, those aunts and uncles and cousins will drive around for maybe an hour, hour and a bit. We'll come back, have a couple slices of pizza, and then I'll take them up and down the street um, because my daughter seemed pretty excited by it. And by the time she was done pizza, no thanks. She was happy yeah. with what she yeah. got. And, uh, but my son, uh, Mikey, mm-hmm. um, he he kind of got used to it every time someone would come to the door that he would get a little chocolate bar, right? Because <laughs> I give him like half a Kit Kat, like half a mini Kit Kat or whatever. Yeah. And then uh, I thought, okay, that's that's a little too much chocolate. So then every time the doorbell rang and some kids say trick or treat, he'd pop up and he'd he'd run right to the stairs and go down the stairs to where we have that big bowl of candy. Mm-hmm. And of course he can't open it. So I thought, okay, not a problem. But no, he just chewed right through it. He just used his <laughs> teeth like a squirrel, like the squirrel the animal, that, yeah. that, that the Democrats killed. And, uh, <laughs> peanut. Just, peanut, there you go. And he <laughs> would just get right into the Kit Kat, right into the arrow. Doesn't matter if it was plastic, he ate that too. So I had to be cognizant of that. But The funniest yeah. thing I saw was when... Uh, they were waiting for Kamala's uh, concession speech day and a squirrel ran across yeah, the stage. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the ghost of Peanut. That was hilarious. <laughs> well, why don't we get into that? Because I don't think people really come to listen to our podcast to listen to about our Thanksgiving and Halloweens and our, <laughs> our, our living and dying with our favorite sports teams. <laughs> Although if they did, we would have an hour of that for sure. <laughs> yeah. So I mentioned earlier that we did travel to the yeah. three uh, provinces where they were having provincial elections. We had a pub night, we went door knocking and did some other things with regards to the provincial election. So Scott actually went to British Columbia and Saskatchewan and we both went to New Brunswick. Um, so those are the three provinces that had provincial elections and each one was different and unique in their own way. Oh, yeah. Um Let's start with BC. Uh, So that was the very first uh, provincial election that happened. And a week after the election actually took place, they finally announced the results, which was that the NDP was to form the next government. Um, They won 47 seats and the Conservative Party won 44. um, And uh, the Greens won two. But... um, they're still counting some of the the ballots and some of the writings. I don't think that'll change the outcome of the election, but just for election integrity, they need to know exactly how many ballots were cast uh, for yeah. each writing. It's because they lost, uh, <laughs> and one of the writings, which it, it probably won't make a difference for it anyway, they lost a ballot box, an entire <laughs> ballot box of like 800 ballots or something like that. So um, that will be counted by a justice, I believe. Mm. And then there are, I think, two ridings that by law, because they were so close, they have to go to a judicial recount, which means that literally the uh, elections BC officials will bring in the sealed ballot boxes that, you know, will be signed by all the scrutineers and whatnot. And they'll take it to a justice in his office and they'll dump out all the ballots onto a desk and the judge and his staff or her staff will count through and they will do the count and that will be the final count. So, uh, which is not atypical uh, in Canada or Imperial countries for this to happen for super tight uh, ridings, but it it, it won't make a difference as to who wins the election. It might make a difference as to whether or not the NTP have a majority, but probably not. Rarely do you have a judicial recount where um, the the, um, result is overturned. Mm -hmm. So the NDP have held power in BC for the last seven years. And as we've talked about before on this podcast, the BC, uh, the conservative BC party rapidly gained support over the last two years. That basically was showing that there was some disillusionment with the NDP, but obviously not enough to form government, although they did obviously extremely well for being a newly formed party. Um, But let's get into the numbers and I'm going to... you know, throw it over to you because that's your uh, <laughs> Well, it's, it's interesting because if you, it, so these three elections in all three provinces are a little bit difficult to compare to previous elections because like the federal election next year in October 2025, they all had riding boundary redistributions. Mm. So you're not quite uh, comparing apples to apples. There's a bit of a difference. But uh, you're right, Alyssa, the Conservative Party of British Columbia skyrocketed over the last two years in popularity. I don't think that was so much a response to the NDP as it was a response to the old BC Liberal Party, which had uh, reformed, renamed itself into the BC United. Um, As the Conservatives were going up in popularity, BC United were going down. The staying power of the NDP, when you look at like the total number of raw votes, 
as well as percentage of the vote has been pretty steady for the last three or four elections. Um, actually going all the way back to almost 2001, uh, the NDP have more or less been the same. Uh, so you, you kind of know where they're always going to be at and, um, and, and that's what you need to target. And uh, good on John Rustad and the Conservative Party of British Columbia for bringing a party back that hadn't won a seat in something like 50 years and half a century. So um, a lot of tight, tight ridings in uh, B.C., um, there was one candidate uh, in his area, and uh, we uh, he was pro-life, so we were able to help him, uh, pro-life uh, BC Conservative candidate, and uh, he won uh, his riding uh, by a margin of less than 300 votes. It was one of the more tight ridings in uh, British Columbia. If you look at the three ridings that the Conservatives would have need to flip, from the NDP to Conservative in order to win 47 seats in former majority uh, Conservative Party of British Columbia government. In those three ridings, the three closest ridings that the Conservatives lost by, they lost by a total of 404 votes. So All three at, of them total. All three of them total. Mm. So it, it came down to just over 400 votes across the province. There were more than 2 million votes cast, 2.1 million. It came down to just over 400 in those three ridings that determined who was going to win or lose government. Now, one of the, what we, we do as an organization is we reach out to every candidate of a political party where um, they're allowed to be pro-life. They're allowed to, you know, introduce pro-life legislation, vote for pro-life legislation, vote against legislation that's objectively not pro-life and not be punished for it, not be, you know, losing, not being, you know, renominated for the next election or something like that. So uh, that was the Conservative Party of British Columbia. We reached out to every one of their 93 candidates um, and this one amongst many, a uh, candidate that didn't respond to us was in the riding of Surrey Guilford. And as of right now, and I don't think th this is subject to judicial recount, so this number might change, but that um, candidate, that Conservative Party of British Columbia candidate, lost that riding by 27 votes. Now, we as an organization have almost 50 people identified in that riding. So, of course, probably a lot of those people did vote and probably a lot of them did vote for the conservative candidate. But had that candidate actually responded to uh, the email that we sent, you know, there was another candidate pretty much next door and another riding in Surrey that we did help that won by just under 300 votes. This candidate lost by 27. If we took just one door knocker from that other riding in Surrey to Surrey Guilford, then this candidate would have won probably by 50 plus votes. You know, if you have one uh, door knocker going for a three hour shift once a week during a six week campaign, on average, that door knocker is going to find that candidate about 50 additional votes. So now you go from minus 27 to, you know, plus 22, I suppose. Um, no, that doesn't make sense. Uh, you're gonna, yeah, you go minus 27 to plus 22, no, plus 23. Um, so you would you would have flipped that seat. Now, of course, that wouldn't have resulted in a majority Conservative Party of British Columbia government, but it would have kept the NDP to a minority. Um, so it's 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 really too bad when um, candidates do not want to because either they're scared or of 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 you know these right wing political parties, quote unquote right wing political parties of uh, speaking with us because we can help. And when we do help, uh, we are, we often are able to make things uh, good in terms of helping candidates actually win their seats. Or if it's going to be a tough election like in New Brunswick, help those candidates um, as best we can. And even though if they lose their seats, they're losing them by margins far, far, far slimmer compared to candidates that uh, either don't want our help or uh, don't get back to us. So yeah, that's, that's really too bad about British Columbia, but, um, you know, the election's over, the results are known. Um, I wouldn't call it necessarily a surprise. I think the polls are pretty sp spot on in British Columbia. The big thing, I think, Alyssa, is uh, going forward and making sure that pro-lifers have their voices heard, that we have pro-lifers elected to the provincial executive for the Conservative Party of British Columbia that at their next AGM that we have pro-life policies that are being passed, 
and making sure that the constitution of that party allows for fair and open nominations. Uh, one concern for the Conservative Party of British Columbia under John Rudstadt was over the last probably eight-ish months leading up to the election, there were many, many stories of um, candidates uh, being disqualified for spurious reasons, not being told why, or just, you know, there, there were stories of saying like, hey, if you step down, like we'll make sure that you get a job that is going to pay like a contract of $30,000 right. once we win government, stuff like that. I, of course, I can't substantiate that. I don't think anyone can at this point, but uh, that's also something to be aware of to make sure that pro-lifers in British Columbia, our listeners in BC are getting involved in the, um, in the mechanics of the party in the various party organs for the conservative party of British Columbia, just like we do at the federal level to make sure that we're having fair and open nominations, that we're actually able to introduce and pass provincial pro-life legislation to substantially reduce the abortion and assisted suicide rates in British Columbia. Like one big issue in, in BC for our listeners uh, and viewers, if you're watching this on YouTube or Rumble, is uh, the Delta Hospice Society in BC. This is a hospice that was founded by volunteers uh, through donations years ago as a place for people, you know, in the process of dying, a comfortable place where their pain can be, you know, mitigated as best as possible, that they have, you know, emotional and physical supports, so a comfortable place where family can come during, uh, you know, that that time of their last days. And the NDP government in BC, which is far more radical than any NDP government, I think, that they've had in Saskatchewan or Manitoba as an example for quite some time, um, forced forced the Delta Hospice Society to provide assisted suicide against their consciences. Mm -hmm. And because the society had refused to do so, because why would they? They confiscated their building. They literally just took away their building, said this belongs to us now and you can no longer be here. Um, so that's the type of government that you're dealing with. But unfortunately, on the other side, when it came to that issue, again, the Conservative Party of British Columbia was, was quite silent, which was really too bad because I think that would have got a few more votes, for example, in Surrey, um, where you have a lot of Sikhs and Hindus, where mm -hmm. that's a really big issue for them, uh, assisted suicide. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's really too bad. But yeah, that's more or less uh, what happened in British Columbia. All right, so let's switch it over to New Brunswick, uh, where the polling wasn't as accurate as no. BC. Um, the Susan Holt Liberals handedly won in New Brunswick, beating out Higgs's progressive conservatives and what most pundits and pollsters thought would be a close race. The Liberals won 31 seats and the PCs won 16. And Higgs, uh, Blaine Higgs, former Premier Barrett Blaine Higgs, lost his own seat uh, in 2023. Uh, and I mean, we've talked about this on the podcast before. He did introduce policy 713, 713, which would require schools to obtain parental consent before minors could change their pronouns in school. And this triggered many conservative premiers, including my own here in Alberta, to follow suit or even have stronger policies uh, yeah, passed in their well. own uh, provinces. And the this... Uh, this type of policy is extremely popular with voters. So Angus Reid found that 78% of Canadians supported this policy and 67% in Atlantic Canada. So even though may the mainstream media may say that this is one of the reasons why Higgs lost, it definitely is not. In fact, it probably did the opposite and helped actually help. It actually helped them and they needed all the help they could get. Um, one of the things that I kept seeing over and over again is just the pure fact that um, the province has a big problem in terms of shortage of doctors, nurses, super long emergency wait times. Sometimes the emergency rooms are just closed <laughs> out of nowhere. Um, and this was never you know, fixed to a degree that was satisfactory to the people of uh, New Brunswick. So um, I think that was one of the problems. That's something that Higgs identified in his concession speech. And, um, you know, the parental consent issue, despite uh, it being super popular, was not popular enough to uh, hand him another electoral win. Well, they didn't really talk about it in the election campaign either, right? Um, I was kind of hoping that they would go to an election sometime last year when that was a hotter issue. Mm -hmm. uh, they brought it up here and there. They were really focused on an HST tax cut from, I think, 15% to 13%. Yeah. Um, so again, you know, a conservative party that's running 
a campaign just on tax cuts and nothing else mm-hmm. and not even like that significant of a tax cut like <laughs> you're, you're, if you're, you're going to ignore the social issues like you're, you're going to have a real tough time getting people out a good friend uh Fatine uh Grisecci was running in uh the riding beside uh Premier Higgs Premier Higgs is riding in Pampsis and uh Fatine was running in uh Hampton Fundy St Martins and both of them lost by very small margins. Um, the premier lost his riding here by a margin of 193, and Fatine lost hers by 224. Now, one thing that's really upsetting about Fatine's riding is that you had uh, pro parental rights, and I believe even I heard from people. I don't know if this is the case. Pro life candidates running for both the Libertarian Party of New Brunswick as well as the People's Alliance of New Brunswick in that riding. So those two candidates together got 273 votes. Fatim lost by 224. Had those candidates not run against, you're not getting much of a better candidate <laughs> no. uh, than, than Fatim. Had those candidates not run there and ran in a different riding. Where I'm not saying that every candidate for the Progressive Conservative Party in New Brunswick is great, far from. Go run against those candidates. And yeah. there, there was a few in the St. John area that you can run against. She would have won that riding by 49 votes. Now, of course, it's not perfect. Like everyone who votes for this candidate, if they're not mm-hmm. running, then they're going to vote for that candidate. But, you know, likely it, it definitely would have been a lot closer of a margin. Uh, yeah. Maybe uh, and, and maybe a win. I, I imagine. And maybe more volunteers or whatever, right? More, like Exactly. More volunteers. Mm-hmm. Because that's a, that's a really good point, Alyssa, because... When you look at vote, uh, when you look at vote splitting in first past the post systems like we have in Canada, not only are you looking at reallocation of votes, you know, these two candidates for the Libertarian and People's Alliance that didn't run in um, Hampton, I want to get the writing I don't know, name right, Hampton Funny St. Martins, if they didn't run there and you switch those, you know, 273 votes to 18, it's more than that because it is the even if it was just, you know, three, four or five volunteers in both of those campaigns, if they were volunteering for Fatine's campaign, like I said, you have one extra door knocker for going out one night a week for a three hour shift for a six week campaign. Uh, let's say those two campaigns together had 10 volunteers. Um, you know, that's 10 times 50, that's 500. There's a really good chance that she would have won that riding by probably a margin of, you know, two, 225, 250, as opposed to losing 224. So yeah. You know, if 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 you're, pro I will life, never understand that, ever. I, like, I, I, be, I believe that there is a role for smaller third parties, yeah, uh, to run. And I think the role is when you're running against target a, the right candidates. Exactly. If if, if <laughs> to, to target a pro-abortion, you know, conservative party of Canada or progressive, uh, conservative party of New Brunswick candidate, especially in tight swing riding, and this is other thing too. Is like, yeah, if if you have like a pro-abortion conservative candidate that somehow won their nomination in like a safe rural riding. And and we'll get to this in Saskatchewan. Don't run against that pro-abortion candidate in that riding mm-hmm. if you're wanting to inflict damage. Mm-hmm. If you're wanting to inflict damage, a by-election is a little bit different, right? And we'll get to that in Saskatchewan of Lumsden Morris. If you're wanting to inflict ja- damage in a general election, find those pro-abortion candidates running for, you know, Conservative Party of Canada, Saskatchewan Party, PC Party of Brunswick, United Conservative Party of Alberta, in those tight swing suburban ridings, where if you're taking away 273 votes, it's really going to make a difference. And you don't yeah. want to do it against a person like Fatine, you know? You want to do it against yeah. a person like uh, Michelle Rempel, for example, although that's not a tight swing riding, but let's say Michelle Rempel were uh, running in, you know, uh, a riding in the GTA, that's where you want to run. That's the mm-hmm. exact place you want to run so very 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 frustrating very frustrating yeah yeah so okay let's talk about saskatchewan then um the core population hubs of regina and saskatoon elected ndp candidates in almost every riding and the rest of the province minus uh, some in the far north were staunchly saskatchewan party so they won the election and once again they've been in power since 2007 And uh, Scott Moe had a weaker but similar sort of policy with regards to parental rights. I think it was something to do with banning biological boys from being in girl change rooms or something in schools. Um, Maybe there was more, maybe there was a little less, but it was something along those lines. Um, 
but uh, yeah, it's just uh, Saskatchewan is conservative. But like, let's let's you were talking about one of the ridings there um, that was very narrow. So let's uh, hear the breakdown there. Yeah, so we um, have a, a couple different ridings uh, to look at. Um, there was one riding in um, Saskatoon Westview where the Saskatchewan Party candidate lost that riding after after the mail-in ballots were counted the other day by 37 votes. Mm. 37 votes. And in that riding, uh, we have just under 100 uh, right now supporters in that provincial riding. So if that Saskatchewan Party candidate responded to our email, just like the one I was talking about in BC. Um, we could have uh, put resources in there. We could have put door knockers in there. Uh, we would have informed our supporters, obviously in the writing, to encourage them to vote for that candidate, uh, That it, it, assuming that that Saskatchewan uh, party candidate was pro-life. And, you know, they could have won that riding by, uh, you, you know, flip it the other way. Instead of losing by 37, win by 37, or mm -hmm. probably more. Mm -hmm. um, so very frustrating. Of course, it doesn't make a difference uh, in terms of whether or not the Saskatchewan party was going to uh, win a majority government or not. Um, it is interesting to note that the Saskatchewan party lost every single riding in uh, Saskatoon and Regina, except for one. And the one that they didn't win it was our uh, good pro-life friend, uh, Ken Sheveldayoff. Um brother of Kevin Sheveldayoff, who's the general manager for the Jets, two good Saskatchewan boys. And uh, Ken, years ago, had ran for the leadership of the Saskatchewan party and mm -hmm. lost to Scott Moe. And um, he had won that uh, riding in Willow Grove, uh, again, by a very small margin. But there there you go. There you go. Like, the, like one of the very few Saskatchewan party candidates that was pro-life running in either Regina or uh, Saskatoon was the one that we were able to help, was the one that we were able to ensure uh, one in a very difficult election for the Saskatchewan party uh, compared to, you know, the last 15 years or whatever, since 2007, almost 20 years. Um, so, it, you know, pro-life policies are winning policies. And if you're a politician that's pro-life, whether you're provincial or federal, you know, if, if you let us know that, we can help you out. We can get you there. We can get you across the finish line. Or if it's going to be a tough election like in New Brunswick, um, your your margin of loss is going to be a lot smaller than the average. Um, I just shut down my New Brunswick page, but, you know, Fateen lost that riding by 224. Uh, the Premier lost this by 193. The average margin of loss for uh, PC Canada in New Brunswick was much larger than that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it, it, it helps to do that. One thing um, it, of note is uh, you have three political parties in Saskatchewan. The Saskatchewan United, the Progressive Conservatives, and the Buffalo Party, they're all somewhat similar. They're small kind of third parties. The la last time in the provincial election in 2020, it was the Buffalo Party that did well. They're the strongest for sure on the issue of uh, abortion and assisted suicide. Um, they, they basically have my dream policies uh, for a provincial uh, political party. I think they have phenomenal policies. The Buffalo Party was kind of the anti-COVID restriction uh, party, and, and that's why they did well in, in 2020. This time it was more of the Saskatchewan United Party because they took on the parental rights issue uh, last year, and there was a by-election in a rural riding in Saskatchewan in Lumsden Morse. And uh, the Saskatchewan Party still won that by-election, but they lost like 20 or 30 points, and they all went to the Saskatchewan United Party because they were the ones talking about the issue and the Saskatchewan party refused to. Mm. To Scott Moe's credit and the cabinet and the party, and it was that combined with what Blaine Higgs was doing in New Brunswick, they then brought in um, a plethora of different policies, obviously not as strong as uh, Daniel Smith's or uh, Blaine Higgs 713, but they, for example, uh, they did um, at least pause funding. I'd like to see it completely defunded, that contract uh, canceled. Uh, yeah. They paused funding for Planned Parenthood Regina, one of the very few Planned Parenthood chapters in Canada. And that's extraordinarily radical, not just on the abortion issue, but all kinds of issues. Uh, not only did they uh, pause their funding, but they also banned them from being in classrooms completely right across uh, Saskatchewan. Uh, so th that, that was good to see. So the Saskatchewan uh, United Party, uh, they got about 4% of the vote. But again, they were targeting riding, like rural ridings where the Saskatchewan party is winning by these huge margins. Like if they really wanted to inflict damage and send a message to uh, the Saskatchewan party, they should have been running. And it did 
they should have been running more candidates in um in uh uh suburban riding so i did look at um the margin of loss for saskatchewan party in various ridings and there is one in uh regina regina is scan of plains where the saskatchewan united the progressive conservative and the buffalo party together got 762 votes and the saskatchewan party candidate lost by 505. now this is a good example of what I would say of where you want to have these third parties actually participating to send a message to inflict damage because that uh, Saskatchewan party candidate in Wiscana Plains didn't get back to us. So I don't know if they're pro-life or not. I'm going to assume not because we emailed them like three or four times. So that's a consequence of that. You know, if, if that candidate uh, was pro-life, I wouldn't have mind going to the Saskatchewan United, the Progressive Conservative, and the Buffalo Party candidates, and try to convince them not to run. Obviously, that didn't work, unfortunately, with 18. Um, or, or at least inform our, our supporters in that riding to, you know, vote for the pro-life Saskatchewan Party candidate, because that candidate was the most winnable pro-life candidate. Or given that that would have been the only Saskatchewan Party pro-life candidate that we identified in the city of Regina, getting all of our probably thousand plus supporters in Regina encouraging them to go and knock on doors for that candidate in that riding probably could have won that riding. So right. yeah, you know, through these three elections, Alyssa, provincially, and we'll get to the American election as well. It's a mixed bag, right? There's, there's mm -hmm. lots of good. There's some bad and there's a lot of close. Um, but uh, it's, it, it was interesting for me. I don't know what you thought about this and we haven't talked about this, but I was talking uh, about this with our good friend Fateen the other night. And it, this was actually the first uh, set of elections, like general elections, where uh, we were involved. We had pro-life candidates. We were on the ground. We were trying to get door knockers out post-COVID. Um, the last time we did that, because we didn't really do that in the 2021 uh, right. general election campaign, because there was all kinds of COVID-19 restrictions and depending what province you're in and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And a lot of people just weren't, most people, I would say most people didn't care, but there were a lot of people that at that time maybe didn't care for you to come through their door. Um, so it, it, it was interesting and it highlighted to me that uh, we as an organization have some work to do uh, post COVID to get people back into the groove of getting out there and knocking on doors because, you know, that one candidate we had in Surrey for the, uh, the BC Conservatives. It wasn't a huge amount of door knockers we got out for that candidate, but it was enough to get them over the top. And mm -hmm. it, it, I would have loved to replicate that across these three provinces. So anyway, I, do you have Absolutely. any thoughts before the three? Yeah, it's definitely like the most disappointing with Higgs, but it's not even close. So it's not even something that, you know, it was, it was, there are obviously multiple, you know, issues there. I, I too wish that it had gone earlier. I understand why it didn't. Um, and Saskatchewan, no surprise there. Um, but BC, what a nail biter, that's for sure. And uh, will be really interesting to watch for in the future. Um, because I mean, if the BC Conservatives did that well, in the first election they were ever involved in, you know, since they reformed, then uh, I think they're only going to go up from here. So, yeah, exactly. Um, Especially if we can get involved in the party and get it in a good direction, mm -hmm. I think it can they can do a lot of damage in a good way. One thing I want to mention about New Brunswick as well is it's been almost forty years. Yeah, it's it, it's it's like thirty four years or thirty six years or something like that since a government in New Brunswick has won three governments in a row has won mm. three elections in a row so new brunswick it, it's not atypical to have one and done like brian mm. Glant was only yeah. elected for one time i think Thank bernard Ford only yeah, only won once um so it's uh it's not atypical and uh, blaine higgs winning back-to-back -back elections i think that's the first time it was done this millennium <laughs> when he won yeah. in uh 2018 and then one again in 2020. So a third time was always going to be tough in that province. It always is. Yeah. Um, but I just, I didn't know thing, if it was by that margin. The only thing worse than Justin Trudeau is putting Justin Trudeau in a clone machine and him coming out blonde. And that's basically <laughs> Brian Galland. Yeah. Yeah. He, um, he, he was more <laughs> radical than Justin oh, yeah. Trudeau in, in many ways. Yeah.
We live in a world that grows through communication. Every connection comes from a dream to be heard and realized. To welcome a better future. What are your dreams? The Ross Media will help communicate your vision through our professional video production services and marketing strategies. I really hope that you choose LaRoss Media for any film projects that you have. It's been great working with LaRoss Media. They're always very professional. They always meet their deadlines. They go above and beyond for their clients. Absolutely give them a try. It will definitely be worth it for you and your workplace and your future projects. I will definitely use LaRoss Media again, guaranteed you will be satisfied with their service and their overall commitment to excellence. Start building connections to your future audience. Visit larossmedia.com and be sure to check out our extended service options. Dream, produce, market, succeed with Laross Media Incorporated. Serving Canada from coast to coast to coast. Um, speaking of Justin Trudeau, he was made the news recently, especially in social conservative circles, because the Liberals announced they were going to introduce legislation that would force crisis pregnancy centers to advertise not only the services that they do provide, but the ones they don't, specifically abortion or lose their charitable status. Now, previously in the last election, Trudeau did say that he was going to target crisis pregnancy centers and their charitable status. So this is sort of like an amendment of what he said. Um, but it's completely um, ridiculous in many ways, specifically because it's uh, it doesn't apply to other charities. So as Scott pointed out, you know, the David Suzuki Foundation doesn't have to declare that, uh, you know, they don't drill for oil or other organizations don't have to, you know, promote the things that they don't do. It's solely crisis pregnancy centers have to advertise publicly that they do not commit or uh, refer for abortions, um, despite the fact that the sole reason why they exist is to be an abortion alternative. Um, so, you know, Justin Trudeau always talks about how he's so pro-choice, but again, he once again he's making choice harder for women in Canada by pushing only one choice and that's abortion and making it harder for women to find and ch choose the alternatives. Um, for the Pregnancy Care Canada reports that in the last 26 years uh, over 170,000 women and men have accessed help at their affiliated centers. These organizations have provided material supplies to over 280,000 clients supported over 22,000 through parental education and reached 36,000 with parenting programs. Additionally, over 11,000 women have sought and received post-abortion support. So there's so many things that uh, pre pregnancy care centers do, and this is just one affiliated one. There are so many other independent ones, mm -hmm. such as Aid to Women and others, um, that do uh, amazing work um, with uh, abortion-minded women, um, some that are very close or attached to abortion clinics, some that have their own buildings. Um, so, I mean, this is really important work. Um, it's much needed work. Uh, there are currently more crisis pregnancy centers in Canada than abortion clinics, so that is a positive uh, s twist to this story, but uh, it, it's very important that women have life-affirming choices, and it's totally out of place for the government to make it harder for them to choose to do so. Yeah, and so just so people know, as of recording, the legislation has not been introduced in the House of Commons. There's just been a notice on the notice paper uh, on the eve of Halloween. So there's your trick instead of a treat. Um, <laughs> and it was a ways and means motion, which just means that um, it, it, it prepares the way for the actual uh, motion of the bill, the moving of the bill for first reading to come before the House of Commons. Uh, it looks like it's gonna come from Christian Freeland, who is the deputy prime minister and the finance minister because there'll be an amendment to the Income Tax Act because the Income Tax Act is what governs uh, what is a charity? Because, of course, charities have a special tax status and donating to a charity, you get a tax credit as an individual or a corporation or I believe a trust as well. So anyway, um, we, we've yet to see what the legislation is, although the government did ha put up a website about what they intend to put in the legislation. And uh, Alyssa, uh, it's, it's even worse than the way you described, because not only would uh, pro-life charities such as crisis pregnancy centers have to advertise that they do not provide 
uh, abortions, but on their advertisements. So these are Facebook posts they put ads for. These are Google AdWords that uh, you would purchase uh, and bid for. Not only would you have to say that you do not provide abortions, but you would also have to refer on your advertisements. You would actually have to have on your ad, the way I read it from the government website, um, you know, aid to women, uh, we do not provide abortions. For abortion information, please contact this private abortion clinic here. Mm. Or lose your charitable tax status. And so it's, it's, it's again, I mean, effective re- referral. Yeah, but don't have charitable tax status then. Like, I just oh, no, hate the can't. whole thing in the first place. Yeah. So, I mean, on one hand, I understand that a lot of organizations rely on it. But on the other hand, I wish that no pro-life organization had charitable sta- tax status so that we don't have to deal with all this government crap. <laughs> <laughs> trying to keep our podcast yeah. rated. <laughs> yeah, and it's... Um, I really hope that there are no crisis pregnancy centers that succumb to that. It's 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 yeah. definitely not it's definitely not worth it, and you're you're going to get way more money for for not doing it. I can guarantee I you think that. So yeah, as, as an organization that does not have charitable tax status, mm-hmm. and and when we have supporters like financial investors of ours ask like, oh, you know, am I going to get a charitable tax receipt? And we explain, no, we don't do that because we don't want to shut up money from the government. Uh, because then, you know, we would only be restricted to up to 20% of our activities being a political nature and 100% of our activities are political in nature. Mm-hmm. Uh, they oftentimes not only are they okay with that, but they want to give more. Um, and uh, for a crisis pregnancy center, I think would even be tenfold for the people oh, for that sure. uh, donate. So, yeah. uh, but again, like to compare it, like take the David Suzuki Foundation, for example, they don't have to state that they don't drill for oil. Or refer they have those to, who do. <laughs> or, yeah, or refer them to, you know, the Canadian Association yeah. for Petroleum Producers. It's completely ridiculous. Nor should they have to, frankly. Yeah. They shouldn't have to. Um, so um, I think this is this is a something that they put in to um, box in and make the Conservatives feel uncomfortable in the 2021 election campaign. Uh, yeah. Because I don't believe the Liberals under Justin Trudeau, as radical as they are, and as extreme as they are in this issue, and I think because they are radical and extreme, I've, I've always believed, and we've ta- I've talked to a diff- few different pro-life MPs about this as well, they do not want to legislate on abortion. They don't no. want to introduce a bill saying that abortions, for any reason, yeah. all the way up to pregnancy, because I think as that bill makes its way through the House and the Senate, they're going to lose that argument. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's why they don't do it. So this is kind of like, the closest they can get to it. Yeah. And now they actually have to follow through with it or at least introduce the bill even if it doesn't get passed before the next election, just to say it's, you know, a tick on the box. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's not as strong as what was in that, uh, or at least the way I read for their, their campaign platform, but it's not entirely unexpected either. Um, right. one, one of the arguments they make on their website is that, you know, th- there's an issue that women are being lied to and this is a big issue. So first off, I would love to know um, who is saying that? Yeah. How many of them are saying it? Where are they saying it? And when have they said this? Or are you just it's completely it's up? completely made up, just like the bubble zones. Oh, women are getting yeah. harassed. Like, no, you can't point to one singular woman who has ever harassed. And, and if they are getting harassed, then charge them under the criminal code for yeah. harassment, which is why that exists. In the which is why code. that's never happened ever. Yeah, it's, 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 <laughs> There's no instance. Harassed. Yeah, but, I mean, if they, if they were, then sure, use the criminal code. Right, you should be harassing people—that's a crime. It's it's a good crime to have in your criminal code. Yeah. Um, my what I found really interesting is when this was introduced. This came was introduced on a Tuesday. And every Wednesday in Ottawa, the political parties have what's called a caucus. So their senators and their MPs get together in a room uh, on Wednesday mornings and they meet to discuss, you know, what's been happening in the week, you know, their plan for the week, how to deal with things in Parliament, stuff like that. And it's called Wednesday Wednesday caucuses. And the House of Commons and the Senate uh, does not sit until 2 p.m. on Wednesdays to accommodate for those caucuses. Normally they sit at, you know, 9 a.m., 9.30, whatever. Um, what was really interesting is that this came out on a Tuesday and I was actually quite surprised in some ways pleasantly that there wasn't a communication issued by the Conservative Party of Canada right away saying, oh, we support this or, you know, uh, <laughs> Justin Trudeau is, is just using abortion to hide from the fact that he's terrible on the carbon tax and we're not mm-hmm. going to, it was just silence, which was really interesting to me. 
And that provided us as an organization and other organizations, the movement, an opportunity to communicate on it before the Conservative Party of Canada did. So we were able to get a press release out. We were able to get some information out. We were able to talk to a few different reporters um, before uh, the caucus met the next day on Wednesday. We were up late that night. So we, we kind of know what the, the NDP are going to do with it. We know what obviously the Liberals are going to do with it because they introduced it. The Bloc likely we know what we're going to do with it. The Conservatives are still a question mark. Mm -hmm. um, and they've been silent about it. They probably don't want to talk about a period, but this is a change. Usually when abortion is brought up from the Liberals, at least under Pierre Polyev, their whole talking point has been uh, they just want to talk about this uh, because they suck on all these other files and we're just as pro-abortion as they are. Mm -hmm. That has not been their talking point. First off, it's been mostly silence, but the very little that they have talked about from their comm shop and the OLO, that's the Office of the, of the Opposition, it's been more of um, we, as a party, the Conservative Party of Canada, have never supported, you know, silencing uh, charities, and uh, we don't plan on on doing that, more or less. I'm, of course, paraphrasing. Mm -hmm. not, it's not super strong language, but it is, it is a difference. And um, that, to me, has been interesting. So hopefully that's a good sign, knock on wood. I mean, we've done our work, and we're meeting with Pro-Life at Peace uh, mm -hmm. pretty soon. Um, so... Hopefully that they can be a little bit stronger and they can actually fight back on this issue. We'd love to see that. Absolutely. We'll see what happens. Uh, all right, let's move along to our final topic, which is obviously the American election that happened yesterday. And we actually knew the results pretty quickly. Um, I thought it was going to take a while, but it did not because Trump won quite handedly 292 <laughs> electoral votes to 224. So far, yeah. So far, yeah. Um, but there are also quite a few abortion rights or rights amendments that were um, being voted on in different states. Um, they passed in Arizona, Colorado, Maryland, and Montana. Um, but the biggest one arguably was in Florida, which was Amendment 4 that uh, was defeated, despite the fact that pro-choice or pro-abortion activists spent over $100 million to try and pass uh, this amendment, which would have basically enshrined abortion into the Constitution up to nine months of pregnancy. That's and the, instead... That's the Florida State Constitution. Yeah, state that's has its own constitution. the Florida yeah. State Constitution. Uh, because it failed, it will stick to the six-week six ban. Um, Nebraska and South Dakota also defeated similar constitutional am uh, amendments. Um, and voters in Nebraska also adapted... Um, or sorry, uh, the voters in Nebraska adopted a measure that allows more abortion restrictions and enshrines the state's current 12-week ban and rejected a competing measure that would have enshrined uh, ensured abortion rights in Arizona's is uh, 15 weeks. And then also West Virginia voted to mm -hmm. ban assisted suicide as well. Uh, so currently 13 states are enforcing bans at all stages of pregnancy with some exceptions and four more ban abortion in most cases after about six weeks of pregnancy. Yeah, it, it was it was a mixed bag, uh, the, the election last night. Um, there was some good and there was some not good. Um, so one of one of the organizations I totally forgot about until last night when they started tweeting is an organization called Democrats for Life. And right. I think they're one of the most courageous pro-life organizations in the United States because they're working really, really hard and effectively and probably efficiently to get pro-lifers elected as uh, or, or nominated or down there be called winning their primaries. And then, of course, once they win the primaries to get elected, whether it be to you know the House of Representatives, state houses, uh, local elections, municipal elections, you know, mayors, sheriffs, that type of stuff. And um, I think they're really courageous because when you go to their website, you know, they're, they're, they're taking on Kamala Harris directly. Um, they're very pointed in, in um, their criticism of her. Um, for example, one of the things they talk about on their website is, uh, you know, the Harris campaign wanted to run a campaign on, you know, unity and bringing Americans together. Uh, but they ran a campaign on pro-abortion extremism. These are Democrats. These, are, these yeah. are people within the same political party. I would love to see that in Canada. Like, mm -hmm. to me, to me, that's way more courageous and I have way, way more respect for an organization like that, as opposed to, you know, something like Republicans for Life, which doesn't even exist, right? Right. Uh, and, and probably should. So 
of the 39 um, pro-life Democrats that were running at various levels, federal, you know what, I don't know if they had any federal, I'll have to double check on that, but at, at, at various levels, at least state and local, maybe even federal as well, of the 39, they got 38 of the 39 elected. Mm-hmm. How impressive is that, Alyssa? Like that, yeah, that, and it's that, much needed. Oh, exactly. Like to have pro lifers on both sides of the political aisle, like that is the dream, especially, especially in a place like the United States that is more or less a binary party uh, uh, yeah. position. Because you can, you can, in in a place like the United States, say, okay, we're going to put all our eggs in one basket, being the Republican Party, because you know it, it, it's a fifty fifty proposition, and that's those are pretty good odds. Whereas in Canada, like. At any time in the House of Commons, there's probably at least five, if not six, political parties being represented by different MPs. If we're going to build a pro-life majority in the House of Commons, they can't all be conservatives. Like we're going to need a smattering yeah. from liberals or maybe Greens or even the NDP. Um, so I, I, this was really I think because they were tweeting out who was winning, and I just kept liking it. I was like, mm-hmm. oh, this is impressive. And what I really like about that organization as well is. Uh, obviously, they're they're against assisted suicide. They're against uh, abortion r- right from conception. By the way, like it is like they're they're very hardcore, but they're also um, really big on like Hungarian type of policies, financially helping women, especially women in, in really difficult positions where they're being coerced into having an abortion, abusive boyfriends or husbands, uh, helping out them financially, helping out them with the law, with the criminal law to protect them. Um, a very holistic approach. Like I, I just when I go through their website, I, I really, really like it. Of course, they're Democrats, so you know they're they're kind of big into you know climate change and stuff like that. And for me, that's not really my jam. But uh, for this stuff, I, I found it really impressive. And the one that I, isn't elected, they're still counting uh, ballots in that one race. So, uh, oh, sorry, no, it was it was a mayoral candidate, and it's a runoff, right? So in runoff elections, you have a bunch of different candidates that run, and then the top two. Um, have a runoff election if you have more than three candidates that are running. And so the runoff is later in December. So it might be a clean sweep. Mm. Now, the ballot initiatives, they were at, in various states, like you said, uh, Alyssa, um, and it's a mixed bag, but I would say, I would still say more bad than good. Although the good is that this is the first time since Roe v. Wade that for lifers have actually won a ballot initiative, which is kind of mm. crazy to think. Because there's been ballot initiatives in places like Ohio, mm-hmm. places like Kentucky, that yeah. pro-lifers were losing. So this is this is good to see finally some wins, but they still got a ways to go. Mm-hmm. Arizona, um, that was enshrined in their constitution. That was lost by a, a margin of 62 to 38. Mm-hmm. Colorado, same thing, a margin of 62 to 38. Florida, Florida, they were able to defeat that amendment, but it needed a 60% vote to pass and 57% voted That's in wild. favor of enshrining abortion as a constitutional right into their constitution. So while it failed, it barely failed. And you had well over half of Mm -hmm. Floridians uh, uh, vote in favor of abortion at any time for any reason. So the pro-life movement politically still has work to do in a place like Florida. Trump didn't help there. CBC Uh, wanted so bad to call it Rovember (laughs) Fest. (laughs) <laughs> That's exactly. Remember, remember the fifth of November. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Maryland, uh, that uh, that one, that pro abortion went past by a margin of seventy four to twenty six. Kind of expect in a state like that. Missouri, that one passed. That pro abortion went past fifty two forty eight. That was close, but you, you say they still got work to do there. Montana, Montana, pro lifers should be winning in Montana. That pro-abortion amendment passed 57 to 43. Nebraska, the first trimester amendment, that passed 55-45. That's a win. The right to abortion in the Constitution failed by a margin at 51 to 49. So still, you still, they still got work to do there. Nevada, that pro-abortion amendment passed 63-37. Not a surprise there. New York, uh, that pro-abortion amendment passed 62-38. Not a surprise there. South Dakota. That one passed by a decent margin. The pro-life amendment to their constitution passed by a decent margin, fifty-nine forty-one. And West Virginia, the assisted suicide one that you talked about, Alyssa, at last count, I believe the count is done. That one, that prohibition, it passed as a prohibition on assisted suicide, fifty point five to forty-nine point five. So, Jeez. 
Yeah, like there are wins, and it's good yeah. to see these wins, and you gotta start somewhere. But the pro life movement has a uh, ways to go. So, you know, you only won five out of 12 ballot initiatives when it comes to abortion and assisted suicide. That's five out of 17 since 2022. Yeah. For the pro life movement in the United States. They, they got a ways to go. One other thing is, I went to our sister organization in the United States, the Susan B. Anthony list. Uh, they do what we do. They try to find pro-life candidates, try to get them to win their primaries, and then uh, once they win their primaries, win the elections. They identified 40 pro-life Republican candidates that were running to be in the House of Representatives. I found this to be quite low. So in the House of Representatives, there are 430 representatives across the United States. So obviously the Republicans are running a candidate in all 435 districts. And Susan B. Anthony List was only able to find pro-lifers in 10% of those. So not great. Uh, but of those 45, 32 have, uh, uh, or sorry, 11 have, no, 32 are elected, uh, 32 won, and there's another 11 that they're waiting, and then there's another three that they lost. Um, of the 100 uh, Republican senatorial candidates, although you, I can't remember how many, because you don't have all 100 Senate seats up every election cycle, I can't remember how many were up this cycle, but they, they're of the Republican senatorial candidates, eight were identified as pro-life, uh, four were elected, three were still waiting and one lost. And then for governors, this is pretty impressive. I mean, they only found four governors. Again, not every governor is up in all 50 states in every election. I can't remember how many governors were up in this election. Uh, but of the four Republican uh, governors that they identified as pro-life, all four won their gubernatorial races. So a mixed Including bag. the king. <laughs> yeah. A mixed bag in uh, the United States. Um, you know, yeah. uh, we, we, we talked about the Trump issue with, um, you know, a very weak, in some ways, borderline pro-abortion uh, Republican policy the first time in 40 years where that's been the case. But at the same time, um, you know, you, you finally, finally at the ballot box saw pushback against yeah. abortion policies. And it, and, and you, the, you saw a pushback against Trump because, I mean, yes. we talked about this before, like originally when he was asked about whether he would vote in favor of Amendment 4 in Florida, he said he was that six weeks was uh, too short of a time and that he was going to vote to uh, extend that that length of time for a woman to have an abortion. And because there was such crazy pushback from the pro-life movement, the very next day when he was asked more directly, will you vote for this or not? He said, no, I will not vote for this. I will vote. I will vote against it. So, um, I mean, that's just because Trump won does not mean that the, the battle is over. This is the type of stuff that the pro-life movement in the States and obviously here in Canada, we need to do um, whether it's within our own party that we're more affiliated with or the opposition. Yeah, exactly. And um, yeah, I, I, I love to, like, if if 38, potentially 39 out of 39, and I understand some are at the local level, you're talking like town sheriffs and stuff like that. But if 39 of 39, even just 38 out of 39 pro-life Democrats identified across the country are winning, I, I, I would like to see the political pro-life movement in the United States put a little more time into the Democrat Party, mm -hmm. uh, especially this time when the Democrat Party has been weakened again like uh and 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 you know i think a lot of pro-lifers felt very trapped in their presidential yeah. ballot like you know you have you have kamala harris who's crazy and just so in love with the sacrament of abortion yeah uh, and then you have trump who's telling states that are passing you know really strong fantastic pro-life legislation that it's it's too strong it's it's too pro-life uh you have jd vance who I would argue at this point, I mean, I'm not a cardinal, I'm not, I'm not his confessor. I would argue that he's not a practicing Catholic because he did come out in favor of IVF and the abortion pill. Mm -hmm. And I think I saw some studies out there that the abortion pill in the United States will, will be account in the next few years for two thirds of abortions down there. I think they have something like two or three million abortions every year. Um, maybe it's only a million, but it's, it's in the millions for sure. So like you're, you're talking about several hundreds of thousands if not millions of, of abortions because you, you're supporting this. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of pro-lifers felt trapped and if the pro political pro-life movement down there can work with Democrats for life and yeah. um, get a little more involved in that party, it'd be great if you have two political parties that are now having to contest for your vote. That's that's exactly what you want. So I know I this is... I like uh, to see that. 
I know this is a bit long and I want to end off reading this, um, but I think that when Canadian uh, Canadians think about American politics, especially this specific election, people are, I know everyone in my chats and in my political uh, messaging groups and stuff are really excited that Trump won even like family group chats and stuff like that. Um, but I think that it's important to remember um, that yeah, in his presidency, this time is very much different, or his uh, lead up to his presidency is very much different than the last time. And uh, somebody who got a lot of flack for this, uh, for their positions, is Lila Rose um, from oh, Live Action. Yes. Thank she's you not, for reading this. She's not I super political, this. but um, she got like, involved. She, and that's, and that's what you want to see as well. Yeah, like you, you want to see people who are pro life leaders who aren't necessarily pro life leaders in the political realm yeah. at the right time when they need to intervene, especially Alyssa, especially when the political pro life leaders are silent on this stuff which I thought was yeah. really embarrassing in the United States, having someone like her who was so clear and so consistent and I would argue so reasonable about yeah. it, um, intervene. I know the tweet you're going to read. And yeah. it's it's uh, this is a perfect way to end this podcast. Well, I think I that a lot of uh, people in Canada, obviously, too, don't, uh, don't know the nitty gritty as well like they just over you know they know the the basics trump uh L nominated you know supreme court justices that overturned roe v wade kamala is a pro-abortion fanatic and therefore those are the you know those are the choices but i think it's really important to understand specifically why pro-lifers in the states were harsh on trump and why they were probably some of them were probably too lenient on him there needs to be a balance because there is good stuff that he did and there's bad stuff that he did um and also specifically understand kamala's uh role in it too because there are pro-lifers sitting in jail in america right now and one of the candidates said that they'll keep yeah they'll keep them there and the other said they won't so like these things are, are important so yeah it, it is a little bit of a lengthy um tweet but i think it's important just to give a lot of nuance to what we're talking about instead of more generalizations Okay, so she said, I have publicly opposed both Donald Trump's and Kamala Harris's positions on abortion over the last few months. Over the past few days, media allies and friends have asked me who I will be voting for on November 5th. I will be voting for Donald Trump. This essay explains the thought process behind my public opposition to the candidate's position, the difference between their positions and my vote. For many, including myself, the single most important issue to consider when deciding who to vote for is the candidate's position on fundamental human rights and in particular, the right to life. Human life is sacred and every human possesses the right to life starting in the womb. Abortion, the intentional destruction of a preborn child is the leading cause of death in America, killing nearly 3,000 children daily. When both of the two main political parties actively espouse anti-life policies, what's a pro-life voter to do? Let's start with Harris's position and why I believe no pro-life voter should vote for her. As Attorney General of California, she selectively prosecuted pro-life journalists who exposed Planned Parenthood selling baby body parts, a federal crime. At the time, Harris was accepting money from Planned Parenthood for her then Senate camp campaign. Harris also used her power as Attorney General to attempt to force pro-life pregnancy nonprofits in California to post abortion advertisements in their clinics. Harris has said that she would pass federal legislation codifying Roe, which would legalize abortion on demand without restriction and supersede all life-saving pro-life laws at the state level. Harris opposes conscience, except for healthcare professionals, meaning she supports forcing healthcare professionals and hospitals, including those of faith, to commit abortions or lose their ability to practice medicine. Along with opposing all abortion restrictions, Harris supports taxpayer-funded abortion. Disturbingly, she has made unfettered support for abortion a central tenet of her campaign. She is also the first candidate for president to tour an abortion clinic as a publicity stunt. Harris's campaign has also spread a massive amounts of disinformation about abortion abortion, claiming that miscarriage treatments are banned in pro-life states, they are not, and blaming abortion-related deaths on pro-life laws. The recurring message in nearly every interview and speech Harris gives centers on her unflinching support for abortion. If fascism is the alignment of all power to the state, Kamala Harris is a model abortion fascist. <laughs> this sounds like Trudeau in a lot of, in a, you know, 99% of the ways. Where, where do you think they get it from? 
Yeah, Harris's campaign is the most pro-abortion campaign in American history. She not only stands against the rights of pre-born children, but she actively works to thwart the rights of pro-life Americans, including conservatives and Christians, to advocate for those children. What about the Republican side? For over 40 years, the Republican Party platform included the right to life, but in apparent effort to court swing voters and quote-unquote moderates, President Trump's allies gutted the Republican Party platform of its pro-life and pro-marriage principles. But his campaign has chosen instead as a path that prioritizes supposed political convenience over fundamental rights. Several weeks ago, J.D. Vance said that he and Trump support access to abortion pills, which account for 60% of all abortions. Yeah, Nearly 2,000 children a day are killed by abortion pills, and one out of every 25 women, women who use abortion pills will end up in the hospital with complications caused by them. They are dangerous for women and deadly for the children they kill. Trump has also announced support for taxpayer-funded IVF. In addition to being active, incredibly expensive, anywhere from 30000 to 60000 per live birth, IVF is incredibly risky for women, and for every IVF-created human embryo that survives to the point he or she can be implanted, many of his or her embryonic siblings are callously discarded for perceived imperfections. Of the human embryo, that do survive this this culling, millions end up indefinitely frozen, suspended in a cruel limbo, waiting to either become convenient enough to be given the chance to live and grow or to die like their many siblings. IVF com commodifies children, turning them into property to be created, used, or destroyed at will. Trump and Vance have expressed support for abortion exceptions for rape and incest and oppose a national abortion ban. They say that abortion should be an issue left to the states, but then at the state level, Trump has criticized and undermined pro-life state laws such as Florida's heartbeat law. Trump and Vance may believe these positions are politically more expedient, but there's no middle ground when it comes to life. Every child, no matter how he or she is conceived, has the right to be given a chance at life. Every abortion intends to end the life of a child. Either there is a right to life or there isn't. Abortion is not a state's rights issue. Abortion is a human rights issue, and it is already unconstitutional under the 14th Amendment, which declares that no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. The goal of the pro-life movement is that every person from fertilization until natural death has the right to life protected by law and embraced by culture. To his permanent credit, Trump historically appointed three of the Supreme Court justices who helped overturn Roe v. Wade, the poorly decided Supreme Court decision that legalized abortion on demand nationally. The overturn of Roe was, was a tremendous milestone for the pro-life movement, but overruling Roe is only meaningful if laws are passed to protect pre-born children at all stages of development. For Trump to oppose many of these pro-life laws when it is his judicial appointments that paved the way for them is a tragedy and a wasted opportunity. I have repeatedly voiced opposition to the recent changes in the Republican platform and in the positions taken by Trump and Vance, urging them to change course. Two months ago, after J.D. Vance first announced on a national television program that he and Trump support access to abortion pills and that Trump would veto a national abortion ban, I publicly stated, if you don't stand for pro-life pro principles, you don't get pro-life votes. I had the opportunity to meet privately with President Trump. He was generous with his time, and we spoke for two hours on my disagreements with him on abortion. Some progress was made. When enough pro-life allies expressed outrage and threatened to withhold their vote, Trump reversed his position on Amendment 4, which would legalize abortion through all nine months in his home state of Florida, and expressed his opposition to it. Kamala Harris's policies and record on abortion are objectively worse than Trump's. If Trump doesn't win on November 5th, it will be Kamala Harris who will assume the presidency. This prospect of what Kamala Harris may do in the next four years as president is worse than what Trump has said he would do on life and could be worse than the negative influence that Trump may have long term on the Republican Party if he wins this election. For all those who vote for Trump in order to stave off the evils that the Harris administration may bring, I believe it is crucial that we continue to speak boldly against any anti-life policies that Trump may advance. This is specifically true for us in Canada because although Trudeau is horrible when it comes to abortion, uh, we need to do the exact same within the Conservative Party. Uh, she goes on, I deeply, I am deeply concerned for the future of the Republican Party, which looks increasingly like the Democratic Party on life. When both parties go increasingly left, where does that leave the millions of Americans who stand for life? 
I've repeatedly said that Trump's new positions on abortion and IVF have discouraged pro-life voters from the thousands of comments and messages I have seen and received in the last two months. And in view of the data about the significant number of Christians who may stay home, I still think that is true. There will be many voters who choose the less pro-abortion candidate and vote for Donald Trump over Kamala Harris. But there will also be voters who have been so discouraged by Trump's position that they may decide to sit this election out. I urge the Republicans to think big picture about this and restore life to their platform and advocacy. If they don't, the Republican Party will not be able to depend on social conservatives and Christians for their votes in the future. Enthusiasm will fade and voter turnout will suffer even more than it does today. I urge the Democratic Party to change as well and to firmly reject the pro-abortion influence that is a strang stranglehold on its future. For voters in 10 states this election, there are also abortion amendments on the state ballots. As we celebrate the fall of the Roe re regime, we must now turn our attention to protecting life in the states as well. It is crucial for voters to reject these abortion amendments. Missouri, well, and she goes on to list. Um, we must continue our fight to secure the respect for human life in both political parties and across the culture. The protection of our children cannot be negotiable. America's future depends on leaders who protect its most vul vulnerable. So, I mean, that summarizes very well, I think, uh, my thoughts uh, personally and politically um, if I were to live in the States. And also, it's very um, easily adaptable to the Canadian political system, the Conservative Party and the Liberal Party. Of course, Pierre is less bad than Trudeau, but there's still a lot of work to be done and it's still not great. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> what it is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. On that note, uh, we will end there. Thank you so much for tuning into our podcast. Make sure you subscribe so you know when the next one comes out. Should be in a couple of weeks. And uh, thanks for joining us. And we look forward to talking to you soon. Bye for now. Nature communicates with us in a universal language. The sunrise starts a new day. The sunset marks our accomplishments. The most beautiful communication is where the speaker and the listener match perfectly and understand the same message. Your future audience is waiting to hear from you. What message do you need to share? At La Ross Media, we fashion beautiful communications through our professional video production services and marketing strategies. Create your own most beautiful message. Visit larossmedia.com and be sure to check out our extended service options. Dream, produce, market, succeed with La Ross Media. Serving Canada from coast to coast to coast. <laughs>